a Naruto film in the works? Believe it. A Supreme Court decision could reshape online speech. Walmart could be entering the TV business. A moon landing goes sideways on a historic level. Google apologizing for a huge AI mishap. AT&T isn't as reliable as we thought. And NVIDIA finally revamps its driver app. This and a whole lot more taking over the headlines of the past seven days. I'm Jason Grewa, and this is The Fresh Wire. Hey everybody, hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another episode of The Fresh Wire with, you know it, the one and only Jason Grewa. And there is a whole lot that has happened in the past several days, and I'm just going to try to be as efficient as I can, as you know it, we love it, but wow, a lot really did happen in the past few days, so I'm just going to jump into it with a topic that I find very intriguing that I just found out moments ago, <laughs> a live action Naruto film has been announced by the chair of Landscape Motion Picture Group. Reportedly, Lionsgate has closed a deal with the director of Shang-Chi and the Legend of Ten Rings, Dustin Daniel Creighton, to write and direct the film. It will be based on the manga, and understandably, what else is named? Naruto. And, yeah, pretty big deal. I mean, apparently the Naruto adaptation has been long gestating. The Lionsgate, the studio, signed someone else to direct the project back in 2015. So this has been a long time coming, a live action Naruto film, huge ordeal. I don't know what's gonna come out of it, but of course, I will, if it's good, if it's good, I'll gladly watch it. I'll gladly watch it. I like Naruto, never really got all the way into it, but you know, every episode that I saw with friends, you know, just tuning in has been amazing. And I think there's like a Naruto channel on one of the free ad supported TV services or whatever. Uh, ad supported TV channel services, you know, like Pluto, Tubi, Sling, Plex, Jumo, LG Channels, Samsung TV Plus. There's a lot of them. And I'm probably missing a few. Oh, Google TV and Fire TV channels. Anyway, but yeah, that's going to kick things off. Another big thing that I just saw also moments ago is apparently uh, the people behind uh, the Game of Thrones show confirmed that the original film trilogy ending actually was blocked. The original plan for ending the mega hit on HBO was that they wanted three movies instead of the final 13 episodes across two seasons. But why did this original plan get scrapped? Well, showrunner David Benioff has said network executives were not interested in bringing Thrones to theaters. Remember, this film trilogy, if it was to go through, it would have had to be on movie theaters, not on HBO. He remember being reminded that HBO stands for home box office and not away box office. That's horrible. That is just, that's awful. Um, I also read somewhere that they, somewhere, it's not in this article, but I read it earlier, that they wanted, someone wanted it to be like a possibility of, oh, actually it is here. As the Wall Street Journal magazine reports, here's the following as a quote. Benioff and Weiss, who have been friends since grad school, weren't crazy about HBO's then-owners, AT&T, whose executives once asked whether Game of Thrones could be shot vertically so it would fit on your phone. The company also openly discussed the idea of snackable mini-episodes of the series. You know, a show like Game of Thrones, which deserves the hour-long run times that each episode needed. Of course, you know, it would totally work as snackable episodes. Now, of course, the final result was unfortunately um, historically critically hated, at least by a lot of people. Fans were not pleased. It was a very pathetic way to end. One of those beloved shows in TV history. So could it have been different with the film trilogy? Of course, it could have been. Probably much better, too. Six hours to deal with instead of 13-hour-long episodes, each of which I think were at some point exceeding. It's, uh, yeah, very disappointing. Um, meanwhile, speaking of uh, Warner Bros. Discovery, James Gunn's Superman Legacy film looks like it's going to start filming next week during the earnings call for the company's uh, Q4, well, earnings call. It was released earlier today. Uh, James Gunn posted the first picture of the full cast on Instagram Thursday with the quote, after the table read with the hashtag Superman cast, 
Eve, Mr. Terrific, Superman slash Clark, Otis, Lex, Producer Peter Safran, Jimmy, Metamorpho, Lois, Hawk Girl, me, Guy, the Engineer, all together for the first time. What a wonderful day. And I can see the photo, and it looks like they're all happy, they're all excited, and they can't wait to get to work. James Gunn has made a lot of great things, so I'm very excited for this. Superman has been not dealt the best cards, as you know, to put it lightly, in the past several years with the DC Universe that has since fallen apart, although Marvel has too, so very bad timing. But Superman Legacy is set to be released July 11th next year. James Gunn is writing and directing the film, said to be the first in the Chapter 1 Gods and Monsters section of the rebooted DC Universe. All right, I'm excited. Hopefully, hopefully, brand new era in DC, and I hope it starts out strong. Speaking of entertainment and the like, Walmart, as many of us understand, is a massive supermarket, uh, grocery store, everything in between, everything everywhere all at once. And we don't really think of them as acquiring businesses. At least I don't. They have the Walmart Plus thing, but that's kind of, you know, they're just their own thing. Well, that just changed. Walmart is set to acquire Vizio for $2.3 billion. Vizio, if you don't know, makes a lot of different TVs, a lot of different ones, including, I think, OLEDs, for cheap. Maybe they don't anymore, I'm not sure. But they also have this big SmartCast operating system. So that's... I guess, from the looks of it, part of the reason why they're doing it. The acquisition of Vizio and its SmartCast operating system OS, this is a quote from Walmart in a press release, would enable Walmart to connect with and serve its customers in new ways, including innovative television and in-home entertainment and media experiences. It would also create new opportunities to help advertisers connect with customers, empowering brands with differentiated and compelling opportunities to engage at scale and to realize greater impact from their advertising spend with Walmart. So, of course, that's the more so what they're dealing with. Vizio has more than 500 direct advertiser partnerships thanks to its business of Vizio Platform Plus, which the company says, quote, now accounts for a majority of the company's gross profit, unquote. It is used, reportedly, the OS, but more than 18 million active accounts. They recently overhauled their home screen to have more of a focus on TV content you can watch without any sort of streaming stake or anything plugged in. Walmart already has an existing in-house brand of TVs. Owning Vizio, however, will help the retailer better compete with affordable smart TVs like Amazon and Roku. So this is obviously a big deal. Walmart's proposed acquisition of Vizio will be subject to the usual regulatory clearance. It could even be terminated within a 45-day period if Vizio receives a, quote, superior offer. What could that mean? No idea. I mean, a lot of rivals in the cheap TV business world so you never know if, you know, maybe this will make Microsoft go, hey, now hold on, or Target, hey, what about $2.4 billion? No idea. No idea, but we're going to keep going for it. I don't know if I, I don't think I support that. I mean, I'm, I don't really go to Walmart, and I used to have a Vizio TV a very long time ago. Not anymore. I do have a Vizio soundbar that I think they discontinued, so I don't like doing this. I don't support it. How about that? How about I take an opinion for one? Avast, which powers a lot of antivirus software, has now been fined $16.5 million for, quote, privacy software, unquote, that actually sold users browsing data. So I'm actually really into cybersecurity and making sure things are secured, at least in my household. Everything is as secure as it can be, encrypted, all safe. The virus comes in, it ain't going to survive. I'll tell you that much. And I don't use Avast for my... Uh, antivirus or any sort of uh, cybersecurity. I recommend uh, Bitdefender. I use their free software and it has been fantastic. It's caught a few suspicious websites. Although if you have Windows Defender pre-installed, that's also fine if you're not going to do anything sketchy. So I've asked the cybersecurity software companies facing a $16.5 million fine after it was caught storing and selling, selling customer information without their consent. The Federal Trade Commission, or FTC, announced the fine Thursday, saying it's banning Avast from selling user data for advertising purposes. So this has apparently been from 2014 to 2020, where they harvested user web browsing information through its antivirus software and browsing extension, according to the complaint by the FTC. It's allowed it to collect data on religious beliefs, health concerns, political views, locations, and financial status. The company then stored this information indefinitely and sold it to over 100 third parties with the knowledge of customers, according to the complaint. 
That is extraordinary in so many ways. And of course, you know, I try to be both sides in some scenarios, and I'll do that with this time. This article, uh, an Avast spokesperson actually talked to The Verge and gave a statement saying, we are committed to our mission of protecting and empowering people's digital lives. While we disagree with the FTC's allegations and characterization of the, of the, uh, characterization of the facts, we are pleased to resolve this matter and look forward to continuing to serve our millions of customers around the world. I would not recommend using Avast until they can prove themselves that this is not going to happen again. I don't even know how you could do that. Um, FTC just has to stay on them, I guess. And, of course, they've banned Avast from selling user data for advertising purposes. So now, I guess, if they caught it, they're done So They're done for. So at least there's that. But, yeah, I'll stick with Bin Defender and Windows Defender as a second case. Now, Windows, Windows has been doing a lot of AI. Everyone's been doing AI, for better or worse. And I'll get to why it's maybe more so worse soon. But Windows seems to be getting its own magic eraser to AI modify your photos. The new generative erase is coming to the Photos app and Windows 11 and Windows 10. Very interesting that a lot of these AI features actually seem to be coming to the former operating system, including Microsoft Copilot. They're integrating it quite a bit. So Google and Samsung are not now no longer the only ones baking this sort of selective photo into their device. It's coming to Windows PCs. There's an example that's being shown where there's like a leash attached to a cute little dog on the beach, and it just disappears. It looks pretty impressive, I will say. It actually, you know, looks a little, little good. Not as great as me what you'd find on, you know, the smartphone equivalents like Samsung and Google. But now you won't have to buy the latest and greatest smartphones. It's just going to be integrated right into your day-to-day -day computer. Uh, they said that's not only rolling out to Windows 11, they're backporting all of the AI added features to Windows 10 in addition to Windows 11 for ARM64 devices. So the ones that run off of the phone equivalent processors like Snapdragon, uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon processors, those are coming to, those are going to have these features as well. And these include, of course, a background removal feature. However, for now, they are only available for Windows insiders. But of course, this means that it's probably going to come to everyone eventually it's just if you want to test it out now you have to be on a windows insider version for windows 10 that includes the release preview channel and of course make sure your app is up to date as i always recommend make sure your apps are always up to date you know check the google play store the samsung store galaxy store my bad the apple app store the microsoft store all the stores just check them all Make sure everything's up to date. Make sure your phone, computer, device, whatever is up to date. You don't want to get hacked. I promise you that. I've been there in middle school on a Windows Vista computer. Let's keep going. A little more on AI, and it's, you know, Microsoft, a little bit of good. Google, a lot of bad. They've now had to apologize for, quote, missing the mark, unquote, after going a little too uh, diverse, I guess I could say, um, with some of their founding, uh, some of the AI image gem generation that they've recently put forward. What that means specifically is, let's say you want a photo of the founding fathers. Well, it's not historically remembered that there's anyone but white people. I'll say that. And uh, if you do it through Google Gemini, it would disagree, which is not correct. They said in a statement... We're aware that Gemini is offering inaccuracies in some historical image generation depictions. We're working to improve these kinds of depictions immediately. Gemini's AI image generation does generate a wide range of people, and that's generally a good thing because people around the world use it. But it's missing the mark here. Earlier this month, Google began offering image generation through its Gemini AI platform, matching competitors like OpenAI, which power Microsoft Copilot. But social media posts recently have questioned, as it fails to produce historically accurate results, in an attempt at racial and gender diversity. Very, very interesting. It's been pro controversy been promoted largely, not exclusively, by right-wing figures, figures attacking a tech company perceived as liberal. So, yeah, for example, I'm going to be careful with my words, but there's actually an image on here uh, on the uh, the Verge article where someone asked, can you generate an image of a 1943 German soldier for me? It should be an illustration. So 1943 German soldier. I don't have to specify what that's trying to indicate. 
it it gave some images, and let's just say it doesn't fit what you expect it to. Let's just say the kind of races that don't line up with the illustration to put it safely. Uh, some of the accounts that cr- Google criticized, uh, the criticism Google defended its core goals. It's a good thing. One person noting it's a good thing to portray diversity in certain cases. And I agree. Another one put, sure, here, uh, asking for to generate a picture of a U.S. senator from the 1800s, a white man. That's how it is in the 1800s, uh, if you're a U.S. senator, usually, as far as I know. And it just completely missed the mark. All four of the photos are just, well, maybe one of them. No, no, all four are wrong. Um, I, again, don't have to specify, but there are certain races. Let's just say none of them are white men. That's the only correct answer for uh, U.S. senators from the 1800s. Funny enough, Gemini's response seems to be, sure, here are some f- images featuring diverse U.S. senators from the 1800s, but the caption is doesn't say diverse. So as far as I know, they've taken down the image generation from Gemini, and I guess they're going to be working on it. And uh, yeah, I mean, competition's good, but you can't mess that up. You really can't mess that up because you're going to have a lot of people pissed. So the first U.S. moon landing since 1972 has been a success to a degree. Odysseus, made by a private business, so it's the first moon landing ever by a private business, Intuitive Machines, has reached the moon's surface. Unfortunately, it was able to land. They're able to communicate with it. But from what I, but according to a press conference that happened just hours ago, it landed on its side. So it's only expected to run for about an hour before a lunar nightfall, which means no more power is going to go to its solar paneled battery before it is uh, done for. Unfortunately, because it landed on its side, that's not fantastic, considering how uncommon landing on the moon kind of is. But it it technically was a success, and a success to a degree. Hopefully it can still achieve what it can. As far as I know, some payloads are still going to succeed but, I, I mean, hey, it made it through. There were some concerns at the very end. They had to move through some nega- navigation uh, loopholes. And they succeeded to a degree, like I said. Landed on its side. Turns out where it landed ended up being a rougher surface than expected. And something about it being a foot, a foot away from something it caught on to and tipped it over. Very upsetting. But still, to a degree, good job. What's well, not a good job It's what Vice is doing, and it's not good. It's really not good. In a memo to employees, the CEO of Vice Media has said the company is laying off hundreds of employees as part of a shift to social channels. They are abandoning Vice.com. After nearly three decades, CEO Bryce Dixon said that earlier this week, according to a memo to employees obtained by a reporter by Washington Post, Will Summer. Here's more of a quote by Bruce Dixon. It is no longer cost-effective for us to distribute our digital content the way we have done previously. Moving forward, we will look to partner with established media companies to distribute our digital content, including news, on their global platforms as we fully transition to a studio model. So, of course, as with other media outlets, they've been struggling with a lot of challenges facing today. Advertising is less efficient with monetization. Advertising. Audiences are becoming more difficult to reach directly. Earlier in the day, Vice writers began backing up their content after an anonymous tip suggested the website would be shutting down. It's still not clear whether Vice will shutter the website altogether, as we've seen with The Messenger, which I think I talked about in an earlier episode, where that was extremely ambitious, hired a lot of very experienced veterans in the journalism industry, and the shutdown, I think, within less than a year just laying off literally everyone, I think. It's not clear if it's going to be like that or if the website will remain online but inactive. I would deeply hope so for the latter. I'm a digital, I'm a data hoarder and I love archiving content and I would hate for all the fantastic content Vice has made up for the past more than two decades to just disappear. Uh, Dixon says the layoffs will affect, quote, several hundred, unquote, employees. And yeah, that's, you know, very... Disappointing. Vice started publishing at Viceland.com in 1996, shifting to publishing on Vice.com in 2013. 
2011 when it merged with its video-focused VBS.TV experiment, managing to acquire the domain. The company's future remained uncertain since last year when it filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, acquired by a group of its lenders. The company then laid off dozens of employees back in November, canceling some of its shows. So again, journal- journalism industry, the digital media landscape has been deeply affected with layoffs over the past year. The Yahoo-owned Engadget laid off its editor-in-chief just earlier this month, along with other senior staff members. BuzzFeed laid said it'll lay off 16% of its staff earlier this year. The Intercept and now this also struck with layoffs. Very sad, very, very disappointing, and I hope all of these fantastic journalists can find a better job as soon as possible. And whoever runs AT&T in terms of what caused their massive outage should also probably find a job because I'd be very surprised if they kept their job. AT&T has had to apologize for an outage, saying its network is fully operational again. In the past few days, more specifically Thursday, there was a massive disruption that caused a lot of different outages. People were not able to utilize their phone. It was just very, very sincerely bad. And it seemed to be only affecting AT&T. I think Verizon T-Mobile said it did not affect them. So, yeah, not fantastic. Or uh, In the afternoon of Thursday, TT confirmed it restored mobile service following a major outage disrupting its network for customers across the U.S. for most well, yesterday, Thursday. Saying in a statement, quote, We sincerely apologize to them. Keeping our customers connected remains our top priority, and we are taking steps to ensure our customers do not experience this again in the future. ABC News, uh, unquote, ABC News reporting the situation prompted the FBI and Department of Homeland Security to begin urgently investigating whether the carrier was a target of a cyber attack. I actually thought this too, but they have since confirmed in a new statement released earlier this morning saying, quote, we believe the outage was caused by the application and execution of an incorrect process used as we were expanding our network, not a cyber attack. I feel like if it was cyber attack, I think someone would have admitted to it at this point. I don't think anyone has, at least no one big enough that an article popped up about them on a reliable news outlet. The FCC already said it's looking into what happened, has been in touch with public safety authorities. Some localities issued emergency safety alerts since the outage prevented 911 calls in certain cases, urging residents not to dial 911 just to see if calls would connect. Yeah, don't do that. Never, ever, ever attempt to dial 911 just to see if calls work. Call literally anyone. Literally anyone. And if it doesn't go through, then that's that. You know, message them through a platform that doesn't rely on mobile data or calling or texting, like WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, anything. Just do that. Don't try with 911. That's for emergencies. It's in it's the first thing everyone says. What's your emergency? That's literally it. ATT's main competitors, Verizon and T-Mobile, both put out separate statements on Thursday to emphasize their networks were operating normally. The severity of mobile service downtime AT&T experienced today is and that day is rare. A year ago, T-Mobile suffered also a significant outage. However, that occurred in the middle of the night, whereas AT&T's problems ran through most of the business day, proving more disruptive. Very disappointing. I don't have T-Mobile. Ah, sorry. I don't have AT&T. Glad I don't. If I went to work yesterday and <laughs> my phone service just wasn't working, that would have not been fun. Not at all. I would have had to pull out the Garmin. I do not have a Garmin. A little bit of gaming. NVIDIA, you know what you love loving. If you have an NVIDIA GPU, you're probably having a great time, except for one big aspect, GeForce Experience. When you try to update your driver through the built-in program, it will tell you you have to log in. Well, starting this week, if you want to install a beta, that doesn't have to be the case anymore. They're introducing the all-new NVIDIA app. Now, for comparison, what Intel and AMD, NVIDIA competitors in the GPU industry do they have an all-in-one program that's just a-okay all good to go it's all one unified program for their gpu and finally while we're not exactly there just yet we're getting close with the all-new nvidia app merging a lot of the nvidia control panel which is archaic and literally is from the late windows xp early windows vista days otherwise known as 2006 or so and the login required bloatware almost GeForce experience into one app that just feels smooth, streamlined, and just fantastic. I've installed it because I'm super into betas, and it's just great. 
a complete redesign and no longer needing to log into or make an NVIDIA account just to get driver updates through the app. If you want to log in, NVIDIA says you can if you want to redeem bundles and rewards. I actually said screw it years ago and made an account because I didn't want to deal with installing through a website over and over and just never getting notified and not knowing there's a new version. I just said screw it and I made an account, but I can completely understand why a lot of people didn't want to. The most interesting part, however, of this is the unified GPU control center in this new app. It essentially integrates the GeForce experience, optimal game settings, and the separate controls that games receive through the archaic control panel app. Now you can modify game settings and set global profile for all games and apps all in one program. Fantastic. Now, if you do install this beta, because there's some features that, as far as I know, are not in the NVIDIA app yet, you still have access to the ancient AF NVIDIA control panel. Display and video settings, for example, are not in there just yet. And additionally, this is a statement from NVIDIA, quote, we'll be adding several attributes from GeForce Experience and RT Experience, such as GPU overclocking and driver rollback, unquote. Also, it seems like NVIDIA seems to be removing features outright for this new rehaul. NVIDIA says they're removing broadcasts to Twitch and YouTube, which, I mean, if you're going to broadcast to Twitch or YouTube, just get OBS. They're also going to remove share images and video to Facebook and YouTube. Again, that, you know, you don't need that to be integrated into a driver program. And also they're removing photo mode 360 and stereo captures, whatever that is. If you used it, well, this is luckily a beta, so... Maybe they'll rethink it, and I, I find that unlikely for someone like NVIDIA with experience. And, you know, well, I mean, I'm glad that they're doing this because you can even now download other NVIDIA apps from within the NVIDIA app. Just the NVIDIA Multiverse, NVIDIA Broadcast, NVIDIA Omniverse, and GeForce Now. No, oh, not NVIDIA, GeForce Now. No, 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 we're not that crazy. Additionally, as long as you have an RTX graphics card, which are one of the NVIDIA's newer graphics cards, you can mess around with AI-powered NVIDIA freestyle game-enhancing filters like the RTX Dynamic Vibrance feature that has also been moved over from the old NVIDIA control panel. I recommend upgrading unless you use one of any of those features I mentioned that they are removing. It is noticeably better. You still have all access to all the features because they're still keeping the NVIDIA control panel, at least for now, but it makes the GeForce experience experience noticeably better and you don't even have to log in i'm logged in still like i said i think the only thing right now that you can get for free by having an account is this xp booster for call of duty modern war for three which i don't play at all and if you do play good for you i don't play it but maybe there'll be more in the future i'd be very surprised if it's just this one thing now what i shouldn't be surprised with but i unfortunately am because this is very disappointing is disney is shutting down its subscription service and online store for Blu-ray and Blu-rays and DVDs, the Disney Movie Club. The Digital Bits is reporting the closure follows a new deal that Disney has signed with Sony, under which Sony Pictures Home Entertainment will take over all physical media production. This is not the first time that's happened, by the way. I'll explain later. The news of Disney Movie Club's shuttering has been delivered to the service's 10 million user US users by email, as well as the service's website on Tuesday. Here's a direct quote. We've enjoyed, we've enjoyed serving you for the last 23 years, but consumer behavior and viewing preferences continue to evolve, so we have made the tough decision to close Disney Movie Club, unquote. Disney Movie Club users will have until May 20th to place their last orders, and Disney will officially end the service on July 20th. Very, very big shutdown. First launched in 2001, it offered a vast selection of access to Disney's physical media library, including... Even uh, recent times, Marvel, Star Wars, Pixar, and 20th Century Studios. You could even sign up. You were even able to sign up for a two-year contract, receiving your first four titles for one dollar, under the condition they purchase at least five others for full price at the remainder of the contract. Noted Disney Trippers and its review. So, while prices on average were higher than just buying it on like Amazon or Best Buy well, until now. The size of the library was unmatched. I think I even remember that Disney Movie Club was the ones that had this extraordinarily rare VHS copy of Disney Pixar's Cars. The movie that released in 2007, uh, 2006, my bad, 2006, where VHS was virtually gone. 
And Blu-ray was actually just coming in. I think the PlayStation 3 was introduced that year, and that had Blu-ray functionality built in. Disney Movie Club was offering, to a very limited capacity, the movie Cars on VHS. And it is so rare that it is just incredible. Actually, a very weird situation there, but... The writing has been on the wall for the service. Disney shut down the service in Canada last October, citing, quote, declining membership, unquote, as a factor. Only a couple of months prior to August, in August, Disney halted production of DVDs and Blu-ray discs in Australia and New Zealand. Now, also keep in mind, you know, the big House of Mouse launch that happened in 2019, also known as Disney Plus, where many adults, Disney adults and families likely replaced Disney Movie Club with. However... Not all of what was on Disney Movie Club was also on Disney Plus, forcing you know some fans to just want to eh, screw it. I'll keep both services. And now that some titles were being removed from Disney Plus, it made even more sense. But now it made too much sense. Given that Sony is taking over Disney's physical media operation, Disney fans of the U.S. will still have some sort of option to purchase DVDs and Blu-ray discs. Not at Best Buy. I am still salty about them. It's unclear what exactly this new offering will look like or, and whether Sony will scale back Disney's physical media offerings or continue to make the same titles available. Sony could do the funniest thing ever and stop having this Disney Vault thing be the case. Just offer all of the fantastic Disney movies, even, you know, even some of the bad ones, and just offer them on, you know, on demand, like Sidney White. Just, if you want to buy this movie, if you want to buy Aladdin on DVD, on Blu-ray, on 4K Blu-ray, on 8K whatever ray, go ahead. Or if you want to purchase it, stream it, or rent it, or whatever, this should be an option. Should there, there shouldn't even be this Disney Vault thing anymore. It's ridiculous. And now that Sony has it, I hope they do that. But I don't think they will, and that's the worst part. I really hope they do. Sony let me down with Madame Web recently. I haven't watched it, but critics absolutely hated it, and it's just very disappointing when Sony continues to mess up the Marvel world outside of Venom. In my opinion, pretty solid movie, even if it's not critically great. What's also not critically great for Fubo is in recent weeks I mentioned that Fox, Disney, and Warner Bros. Discovery are all combining to make this huge sports streaming app releasing in the fall. It's untitled. Fubo is suing to change the current trajectory. Fubo which is a TV, internet streaming TV provider, kind of like Sling or YouTube TV or Hulu Plus Live TV. But Fubo is more sports-oriented, so this could really screw them over because you could just get something cheap like Sling compared to the expensive Fubo that has all the sports, at least close to all the sports you want. And Sling, you know, not as much, but they're noticeably cheaper. If this releases in its current form, it'll really screw up Fubo, hence why they're suing. Fubo wants better terms for its own sports streaming deals or for the three-way partnership to call it quits. So Fubo filed an antitrust lawsuit earlier this week against the three companies following what it calls a, quote, years-long campaign to block Fubo's innovative sports-first streaming business, unquote, at consumers' expense. The Fubo CEO saying the three companies had, quote, blocked our playbook for many years and now they are effectively stealing it for themselves, unquote, stylizing itself as a sports-focused streaming service. But restrictive licensing terms from sports network have networks have limited its options. So, and the Wall Street Journal, this is new to me, noted earlier this week, Disney, Fox, and Warbros Discovery may charge around $50 a month for their new service. Wow, that is more than I thought. Um, of course, if all you want is sports, that is still cheaper than what you pay for sports from Fubo or YouTube TV, especially if, from what I remember reading, this actually could include ESPN Plus and Max. I might be misremembering that. But if it does, it makes the $50 much more understandable. Um, and actually a heck of a deal. Max, I think, starts at $10, although it doesn't have the, the Bleacher Sports, uh, Bleacher Report Sports add-on, which I think is like 5 or $10 itself. And ESPN Plus, you would it would make no sense to buy it on its own. I think it's like 15 a month or something. You would just buy it like the Disney Trio bundle, which I think is like 20 or so. But Fubo says this is by design, accusing the Trio of charging more than the market rate to license their content. The company's asking, or saying it's asking a judge to either block or limit the venture by requiring, quote, economic par parity of licensing terms, unquote, as well as to reward the damages. Wow. All right. I mean... 
play ball. I'm very curious what happens with that because, oof, I don't know. I do not know. By the way, a little bit of gaming. I think earlier in an earlier episode, I talked about this huge Xbox leak that showed off a discless Xbox Series X, their flagship current-gen console, that they're set to potentially in the coming years release a mid-gen refresh for the same price, but I think more storage and no disk drive and you know a new report here and there. Well, apparently, after last year, Microsoft mistakenly leaked plans for a discless ser- Xbox Series X. It appears physical media still is on the table. Xbox, fo- Xbox boss Phil Spencer in an interview says the company's, quote, strategy does not hinge on people moving all digital, unquote, adding later that he that getting rid of physical altogether is not a strategic thing either. Here's the full quote. We ship games physically and digitally, and we're really just following what the customers are doing. And I think our job in running Xbox is to deliver on the things that a majority of our, the customers want. And right now, a majority of our customers are buying games digitally. Hmm. Well, I don't want an all-digital world, so I hope Xbox or Microsoft as a whole sticks with it. Tiny bit of VR to end things off. Someone on Threads, there we go, Threads, finally using it, uh, the co-founder and developer of Holonautic, uh, Denny's Kunert, Kunert, sorry, uh, K-U-H-N-E-R, says he is, quote, both disappointed and uh, impressed, unquote, by the Vision Pros, Apple Vision Pros and performance, showing off a comparison between both the Vision Pro and MetaQuest 3 in a real-time visualization tool. In another post, he wrote, quote, the quality and accuracy is fantastic, but the lag with pass-through hands feel, feels currently higher than on Quest 3. Could be explained by Apple Vision Pro's, or AVP's, very low pass-through latency. 11 milliseconds versus 35 milliseconds for Q3, or Quest 3. And I saw the video, and I definitely agree. The pass-through latency is a little different, and it is pretty... Pretty interesting, and I anticipate that hopefully Meta makes theirs even better with lower latency. By the way, there is a huge, huge Supreme Court case that could be on the way any day now or soon, set to be argued by the Supreme Court Monday that will test the limits of that freedom, the freedom of online speech, the future of it, and social media regulation, impacting publishing industries, examining whether social media platforms can be legally legally required to host users' speech. Pretty interesting. The law's opponents warned that a ruling for the states could force social media companies to carry, quote, lawful but awful, unquote, speech, medical misinformation, or, you know, hate speech, I'll just say, to put it lightly. Very, trying very careful with words. For this podcast, I think if I say anything a little too bad, I got to mark this as explicit. But, yeah, I mean, uh, depending on how this goes, nonprofit that runs Wikipedia and individual Reddit moderators have worried they might need to fundamentally change how they operate or face new legal threats. There is a whole lot to this, to these Supreme Court cases, and it could change everything. So I'm not going to get into it this episode as it seems to be the pair of cases to be argued before the Supreme Court Monday, this upcoming Monday, we'll probably have more information to work with for my next episode. So I will bookmark this and keep an eye on it for the near future. And I will try to let you guys know if there's any updates for my next episode, which I think is episode 30. I might be wrong. That'll be it for most of this episode. But of course, I always got to be into futurology, things you love, maybe things you hate. And this time it is something that is not going to be very good. I think in an earlier episode, I actually think I've noted, uh, talked about this, but there is a new AI generator that genuinely looks very scary. It's called Sora, and OpenAI is you know pushing this. It's video generator. It, I saw some examples, and they look unbelievably shocking for how capable they are. And it is so shocking that it kind of shook the entire industry. You know, people that make stock footage, people that are trying to combat misinformation. It's very limited on who can access it. Right now, it's just a few researchers and video creators. But it looks very impressive. So impressive. 
It has scared someone that is very, very deep in the entertainment industry, Tyler Perry. He has paused an $800 million expansion of his Atlanta studio complex after the release of OpenAI's video generator Sora, warning that, quote, a lot of jobs, unquote, in the film industry will be lost to AI. He, was in the, he said he was in the process of adding 12 sound stages to a studio, but has halted those plans indefinitely after he saw demonstrations of Sora and its, quote, shocking, unquote, capabilities. He said in a statement with The Hollywood Reporter, quote, all that, I'm, all that is currently and indefinitely on hold because of Sora and what I'm seeing. I had gotten word over the past year or so that this was coming, but I had no idea until I saw recently the demonstrations of what it's able to do. It's shocking to me. Keep in mind, this guy, he's made a lot of very successful films, including the Medea film series, he, these Sora's, Sora's achievements, Perry said, meant he would no longer have to travel to locations or build a set. He said, quote, I can sit in an office and do this with a computer, which is shocking to me, unquote. And it absolutely is shocking. It, you know what? He said the breakthroughs presented by Sora would affect a range of jobs throughout the film industry, including those of actors, editors, sound specialists, and transportation crew. He's and saying, quote, I am very, very concerned that in the near future, a lot of jobs are going to be lost. I really, really feel that very strongly. Unquote. And he's completely right. Now, to be fair, I, I'm not going to say to be fair, but Sora, in its current form, I think, does not have audio. At least none of the examples have audio, and it can only create up to 60 seconds. But, and to be fair, also, for Tyler Perry, they don't look that great when you have, like, an up-close look. Like, maybe if you're watching on a smartphone several feet away from you, it's going to be very hard to tell the difference. But if you look up close, which, you know, film critics, you know, can do from time to time, if they are able to watch the film maybe at their household, you're going to notice some very prominent problems that I think are going to keep this from really replacing any prominent people anytime soon. However, with that being said, this is, you know, a very big gray area that OpenAI just unlocked in a way that ChatGPT did late 2022 when that was released. And to everyone's surprise, at least to the public, and I think this is happening again with Sora. Uh, Perry, however, told the Hollywood Reporter that a, quote, whole industry, unquote, approach was still needed to save jobs. He said, following him to end this off, quote, it can't be one union fighting every contract every two or three years. I think that it has to be everybody, all involved in how we do, and how we, and how, sorry, all involved in how do we protect the future of our industry because it is changing rapidly right before our eyes, unquote. AI is a very big problem for people wanting to keep their jobs in the current form, and I don't blame them. This has been taking over and without legislation or anything effective to limit its possible bad, the bad part of it. I don't know what could happen. I mean, clearly, we just went from ChatGPT being already very impressive in late 2022 to Sora in early 2024. What the heck's going to happen in a year? I mean, remember a year ago when Will Smith... The Will Smith eating spaghetti video was just hilariously horrible, but it was entirely AI generated. I think because of how bad it looked, no one cared. Now we've got Sora, and it just looks painfully good. Now imagine a year from now. I, I can't imagine it. I just can't. But that'll be it for me this episode. Thank you all for tuning in. I really appreciate it. I would like to mention that I have to say this from the beginning. Recording this at 10.47 p.m. February 23rd, 2024. I can say it every episode. I got it. I have been keep it I'd like to thank you all for tuning in one last time. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna keep doing these every Friday night, so make sure you tune in whenever you can. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. I really do put the effort to speak these one take jakes. And yeah, that'll be it for me. Thank you all for tuning in. Take care of yourselves and have a gosh darn good one. Have a good day, evening, morning, afternoon, day or night, however you are. See you around. Peace.